Hi, this lecture is a continuation of the integumentary system part one lecture. During this part, part two, we are going to talk about the glands of the skin as well as the wounds and disorders of the skin. Skin, and, uh, which is part of the integumentary system, houses several glands. We're first going to classify glands by the mechanism of secretion and then talk about the different types of glands. Based on the mechanism of secretion, there are three types of, of glands. First, the mirocrine, also known as the ecrine glands. Two, the apocrine glands. And three, the holocrine glands. So the next illustration, I will explain the difference between the secretion mechanisms of these three types of glands. On the far left, you have a mirocrine or the ecrine gland. So you look at the epithelial cells right here, you can see the lumen right here. So in the mirocrine or ecrine secretion mechanism, you have the cells. The cells are secreting the product right here, and the product gets secreted out into the lumen by simple exocytosis. So the product is more watery and um, not as viscous because it's simply getting secreted by exocytosis directly into the lumen right here. Now through the lumen, it gets secreted onto the surface of the skin via some kind of a duct. So an example of this is the regular sweat glands that are located all over the skin. So those are an example of the mirocrine or the ecrine sweat glands. Now, in the apocrine mechanism, you have the epithelial cells right here. Now, the epithelial cells are producing the product. They're producing the secretion. The secretion accumulates in part of the cell. And when it's time to secrete or, or start to secrete the, the, the product into the lumen, a part of the cell gets pinched off. You can see how part of the cell is pinched off via budding and the whole, this pinched off part of the cell gets secreted along with the product that it contains. So as a result of that, this product that is secreted by the apocrine mechanism is a little bit more thick, a little bit more viscous than the mirocrine secretion. So an example of that is the apocrine sweat. The apocrine sweat glands are, are ones that develop in the axillary region, the inguinal region, the perineal region during puberty. Uh, mammary glands that produce breast milk are also an example of apocrine glands. Holocrine mechanism is a little bit more different. So you also see epithelial cells lining the lumen over here. Now the cells produce the product right here. The product remains in the cell. Now, when it's time to secrete or excrete this product, the cell divides by mitosis. You can see how the cell is dividing by mitosis. And the older cell containing the product is pinched off. So in the holocrine mechanism, the whole cell, so holocrine, think of holocrine as a whole cell along with the product is part of the secretion. So an example of this is the oil or the sebum that we secrete. So sebaceous glands are example of the holocrine mechanism of secretion. So now let's take a look at the types of sweat glands. So sweat glands, sweat is a filtrate of blood plasma. So everybody knows by this point that plasma is blood without the blood cells. So it contains waste products. Most of the time, sweat is insensible. So your body produces sweat as a matter of waste excretion. Your body produces sweat as a, 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 for, for thermoregulation. You produce almost 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 liters of sweat per day. When sweat is visible, so when you see visible sweat, you see drops of perspiration on a person's face. After working out, you see visible sweat on a person's clothing. That is called diaphoresis. Now, Typically, sweat by itself doesn't have a distinct odor, but when it combines with bacteria, now this bacteria could be residing in a person's, on, a, on the person's skin, it could be on the person's clothing. Now, when bacteria is involved and that interacts with the sweat, the, the, 
the product of bacterial metabolism here could produce body odor, and that is called bronchidrosis. And as we talked about earlier, there are two types of, of sweat glands, the mirocrine sweat glands and the apocrine sweat glands. The mirocrine sweat glands are found all over the body, and they produce the, the less viscous, the more watery sweat. Uh, most important bodies to cool, the, the most important function of these glands is for the body to cool off. And the apocrine sweat glands are found in the axillary, the inguinal region, the perineal region, uh, facial regions of males as well, and they produce a more thick, more viscous sweat, uh, which contains pheromones. The sebaceous glands are located alongside of the hair bulb. And they produce an oily secretion. The secretion mechanism is holocrine secretion, and this secretion is called sebum. Now, it, being an oily secretion, it, it moisturizes the skin, it's slightly acidic, so it inhibits bacterial and microbial growth. In sheep, the secretion is even more thick and viscous, and it is part of a lot of moisturizing skin and hair products. Now, when we talk about oil and skin, we cannot possibly refrain from talking about acne. What is acne? Now, the amount of acne a person gets varies with age. It's determined genetically. Um, factors like stress, nutrition can contribute towards how much acne a person gets as well. So when sweat, uh, not sweat, but when sebaceous glands get inflamed, that can contribute towards acne. And sometimes dead keratinocytes can block the opening of the sebaceous glands, and that causes the oil to accumulate inside. When it gets accumulated, it attracts bacteria, and bacterial metabolic products can cause pus and cause acne. The next type of glands are the ceruminous glands. They're only found in the external ear canal, and they produce a very thick, waxy secretion. Now, this waxy secretion, one, makes the internal ear waterproof, so it prevents water from getting inside your internal ear canal, and it provides a soft, flexible environment for the eardrum or the tympanum. It also serves as a natural insect repellent because of its bitterness. The next type of gland we're going to talk about is mammary glands. Now it is important to distinguish mammary glands from breasts. Breasts are secondary sexual characteristics in females. Both males and females have breasts. Mammary glands are secretory organs that mature during pregnancy and cause lactation. Breasts of both sexes do not contain developed mammary glands. So mammary glands are something that develop when prolactin is produced by, by a female after giving birth. Now, in most mammals, there are two rows of mammary glands. Primates only have the anterior most glands. Now, polythelia. Polythelia is a condition where, where an individual can have an extra set or even one extra nipple, usually along the milk line, along the line where the mammary gland is present. Now, back in the day, having polythelia, which is a medical condition, uh, was considered one of the characteristics for a person being a witch. Talking about the sensory receptors, in part one of this chapter, we talked about the superficial and the deep sensory receptors. In the epidermis, we talked about the Meissner corpuscles. We talked about um, we talked about the Merkel uh, Merkel discs, as well as the free nerve endings. As far as the deep uh, corpuscles were con uh, considered. We talked about the Pekinian corpuscles, which were pressure receptors. So your skin contains several different types of sensory receptors. So you have general sensory receptors for light touch, uh, deep touch, pressure, vibration, pain, itch, tickle. As you're sitting down, you can feel the wind on your face. So the, the, the integumentary system has quite a few sensory receptors in it. 
The next part of the chapter, we're going to deal with wound healing and skin disorders. Being the most superficial organ, the integument is prone to cuts, wounds, bruises, and trauma. So anytime you get a wound, what is the first thing that you feel? Now, typically, when there is homeostasis, you do not feel pain, right? So the first step that you feel when you get a wound is pain. So let's take a look of what happens right here. So let's take a look at this circuit. First, a stimulus. A stimulus receptor. So you have a stimulus. Say that there's a pinprick. Your skin feels a pin. Prick. So think about that for a second. What do you feel when a pin pricks you? You feel pain, right? So there's a sensory receptor that is sensing pain. So pain is what you feel first. So there's a pain receptor that first feels the pain. So there's a change that has been sensed by your stimulus receptor. Now this receptor, the pain receptor, has sent an input to your control center. What is the control center? It is part of your central nervous system. So it is either the spinal cord or it is the brain. So the stimulus receptor is going to send an incoming or an afferent signal to the spinal cord or the brain or the central nervous system. Now what is the central nervous system going to do? The central nervous system is going to generate an output or an efferent signal and it is going to send it out through an efferent neuron to an effector organ. What is an effector organ? An effector organ is something that is going to, to make you reverse what has just happened. So when you feel a pinprick, what is your natural reaction? Your natural reaction is to pull your arm away from the pin. You don't keep your arm right at the pin and keep the prick going, you pull your arm away. So in this case, your effector organ is going to be the muscles in your arm. The muscles in your arm are making your arm pull away from the pin prick. So the effector organ in your case, right here in the pin prick example, is going to be the muscles in your arm. So when you pull it away, is your arm still on the pin? No. So are you still going to, is, is that pain receptor still being stimulated? No. So that is going to take back the disruption towards homeostasis until something else causes a disruption again. So let's go over this one more time. In step one, something disrupts your normal condition or homeostasis. This disruption is sensed by a sensory receptor. This receptor is going to send an input to the control center or the central nervous system. The central nervous system is going to generate a signal called the output signal. It is going to send it to an effector organ. The effector organ is going to work on reversing that disruption, taking you back to the stage of homeostasis. Now in terms of skin, skin wounds, you can have a shallow wound, which is an epidermal wound, or you can have a deep wound. Now, deeper wounds are naturally take longer to heal than shallow wounds. Epidermal wounds rarely cause scar tissue. Dermal or, or subcutaneous wounds usually have scar tissue that occurs with it. So this illustration explains how epidermal and dermal wounds heal. Now in epidermal wounds, take a look at this right here. This is the basement membrane right here. This is the stratum basale. So when you have an epidermal wound, the cells of the stratum basale migrate and divide until this gap is bridged. Now the cells of the stratum basale are going to divide until they form a thick enough stratum spinosum, then the cells of the stratum spinosum as they grow older are going to form the stratum granulosum, the stratum lucidum, and the stratum corneum. So it, it, it doesn't take as long to 
heal an epidermal wound as it does to take a deeper wound. Now, in deep wound healing, you have something called the inflammatory phase and a maturation phase. The inflammatory phase is when your body is having an inflammation type response. So take a look at this. A blood vessel here has been punctured. So as the blood vessel has been punctured, you see the blood, the red blood cells and the white blood cells coming up here. There's a clot that has formed. So eventually you see that there's going to be a scab formed at this area of some kind. You have these macrophages here that are going to end up clearing up the junk that is going to accumulate here. Now, scar tissue is going to, because connective tissue takes longer to heal than epithelial tissue, there's scar tissue going to form right here, and the epidermal tissue is going to heal up just like it, a normal epidermis would. The blood vessel would also heal up normally. So this part right here would take the longest time to heal. Now a burn, as opposed to a wound, is caused by a lot of different things. Electric burns, you have chemical burns, radiation burns, hot water burns, different types of burns. Now, it is the leading cause of accidental death. Now with burns, you have things like dehydration, you have secondary infections, Getting fast treatments, treatment for burns is the key in saving a burn victim's life. If a burn covers 70% or more of the person's body, the mortality rate is about 50%. Now, the burn is categorized by how many layers of the skin are affected. If only the epidermis is affected, the burn would be categorized as a first degree burn. If the epidermis and the dermis is affected, it would be categorized as a second degree burn. And if all three layers of the skin are affected, it would be a third degree burn. So let's take a look at each and every one of these burns. So in a first degree burn, you see you have the skin has, um, the skin becomes red, it becomes painful, but the characteristic of a first degree burn is that there are no blisters. So a typical sunburn can be a first degree burn. However, a severe sunburn can also be a second degree burn, but most, most sunburns are first degree burns. Now this is when, uh, this burn is easiest to heal because the stratum basale quickly regenerates and the skin on top usually just peels off. Uh, on its own within a few days. A second degree burn is characterized by blistering. In a second degree burns, there's usually always blistering. So epidermis in this regenerates from the stem cells in the stratum basale, and um, the sudoriferous, which are the sweat glands, help in the regeneration process as well. So you can clearly see that the blistering component in the second degree burns. In, in, in this type of burns, you have the epidermis and either the entire dermis or parts of the dermis which are destroyed. In the third degree burn, all three layers of the skin are destroyed. So you have the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis. This is called fibrosis. Now sometimes this black portion that is because the tissue over there has completely died off. So that's called necrosis. Now, a third degree burn can also cause loss of function. So the damage can be so bad here that all the hair follicles, the sweat glands could be destroyed and therefore there could be no stem cells that are remaining to regenerate the skin here to begin with. Now, this is also the type of burn that is most likely to develop a secondary infection. So it's, and uh, victims of third degree burns are also most likely to develop severe dehydration. Now third degree burns typically require skin grafts of some kind because, because a third degree burn is so severe that they have lost the stem cells that can regenerate the skin. 
So there are quite a few graphed options. You can have temporary graphs or you can have permanent graphs. A permanent graft is something that has that is least likely to be rejected by the patient's body. A temporary graft is a graft that is put in place temporarily to reduce secondary infections or severe dehydration. So first, let's talk about the temporary graft. A homograft or an allograft. A homograft is a graft from a person, from another unrelated person, but, a, but an individual of the same species, basically. So from any other human being. They, can, they may or may not be related. So from an unrelated person. Skin from someone else. A heterograft or a xenograft is skin from some other species. So it's usually cow skin or, or bovine or porcine pig uh, from a pig. So it's just used to cover up the area so that it's not... So the, the flesh and the underlying muscle and, and internal organs are not exposed. Amnion from afterbirth, or the most safest option, which is being preferred these days, is artificial skin from a silicone or collagen. Now, permanent graft is an autograph, tissue from the patient. So skin from another part is taken and it is regenerated in the laboratory and then grafted onto the, the patient. So from cultured keratinocyte patches or an isograft, which is tissue from an identical twin, should the, the, the patient have one. Now talking about skin cancer, there are three main types of skin cancer and they're listed here in increasing order of their severity. And by severity, I'm talking about the, the, the mortality rate. So first, we have the basal cell carcinoma, followed by the squamous cell carcinoma and the me malignant melanoma. So first, let's talk about the basal cell carcinoma. Over here in the parentheses, you see the recovery rate. So basal cell carcinoma is characterized by a small strawberry-looking a protrusion on the skin, and it arises from the keratinocytes of the stratum basale, and it can invade into the dermis. So it appears as a pearly white edge in a central depression. So it looks like a bump with a depression in the center, and it is least dangerous. About 78% of the patients make a full recovery if caught early enough. So it is the least dangerous of the different types of skin cancer. The next one is a squamous cell carcinoma. It is, I would say, fairly dangerous with about 20% rate of recovery. It arises from the keratinocytes as well, but not from the stratum basale. This occurs from keratinocytes in the stratum spinosum. Now, what makes it dangerous is that they undergo metastasis fairly quickly and they can migrate to the lymph nodes. This is what makes them, the metastasis into the lymph nodes is what makes them more lethal. Now, lymph nodes are, are, are organs of your lymphatic system, and they're draining out toxins. They're seeds, basically, that are filtering the lymph and taking out toxins out of your body. So that is what can make this type of skin cancer lethal. Now, the most lethal of them all is a malignant melanoma because they can metastasize extremely fast. The rate of recovery is only about 2%. And this is the cancer of the melanocytes. Oh, if you recall from part one of the chapter, you know what melanocytes are. And they usually um, arise from a pre-existing mole. And they're characterized by a mole that that looks like it is growing. So if you have a pre-existing mole and it looks like it's growing in size very quickly, then it's time to go to the dermatologist. Now there is a gene, there's an oncogene, the BRAF gene, um, which has been linked to malignant melanoma in men. So if, if malignant melanoma uh, is, if you have a family member or a close family member in your family that has had malignant melanoma, um, a doctor can re refer you to a genetics counselor for genetic testing of the BREF gene. So this concludes our uh, integumentary system chapter.